Amen. Time for a few moments with the children. As you are aware, we have covered over the last Sunday evenings the subject of problems, and we have discovered that we all have problems of different sorts. And uh, we concluded that regardless of who we are, we all have one particular problem that is common to all of us. And that is the problem of sin, because the Bible tells us we're born in sin and shapen in iniquity. That means that when we're born in sin, no one has to teach us how to do the wrong things. It's a natural part of us. It's how we are made. Sin governs our thoughts and governs our actions. And the older we are, the older we get, then the greater that problem of sin becomes. But the glorious truth is, and we have discovered this in our little talks, that uh, the Bible confirms that there is an answer to all of the problems of sin, regardless of who we are or what that sin might be. You see, we don't all sin in the same ways or in the same things. Sin is common to us all, and we all disobey God, and we all do things that are not pleasing to him that indicate our rebellious nature. But there are certain sins that are more uh, awakened, more alive, and more noticeable in certain cultures, in certain countries, and in certain groups of people, and in certain individuals. And not everyone is affected in the same way by the same habits or the same sins. And the Bible covers all of that because we read that Jesus is the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. So that means that Christ is not only able to deal with your problem of sin or my problem of sin, but anywhere in the world and in any person across the world, God is able to deal with the problem of their sin. Now, as we carry that little thought through, we're going to move into uh, another dimension or another area that deals particularly with uh, one particular character in uh, in the Bible. If I was to hold that up to you, can you read the name of this person over here? Can you read that name? Have you seen that name before? Do we have a Simon here tonight? Is there a Simon in church tonight? No Simon. That's good, because we would all have to do what Simon says, if Simon were to be here. Simon is this handsome-looking fellow here. And uh, he grew up, you see what's in behind him here? And what this is over here? That's a boat on the water. And this boat is on the water of the Sea of Galilee. Now, we read a lot in the Bible about the Sea of Galilee. And we also read a lot about this man, Peter. Peter was a fisherman. And one day, Jesus was uh, passing by, and uh, we're going to learn about this next Sunday night, God willing, so I won't tell you the whole story tonight. But um, Jesus invited Peter to follow him. And instead of going out on this boat to catch fish, Jesus said he would teach him how to go out into the world and become a fisher of men. I'm sure you adults 
I've heard about the lady uh, who was giving her testimony one evening, and uh, she said, when Jesus called me, he called me to be a fisher of men, and I've been fishing for men ever since. And I, what she meant by that was that she was sharing the gospel with those that she had contact with. And, and that's what Jesus called his disciples to be. Now, we're going to learn more about what that means as we go through this little, little story. Uh, because when we come to know the Lord Jesus as our Savior, then one of the things that we will want to do, and one of the things that we should do, is to tell others about Jesus. So instead of fishing for fish, we are to fish for, uh, for men. And uh, that will come out uh, possibly next Sunday night. But here is Peter. When Peter was born, his parents give him a name. And his name was Simon. Now, do you know what the name Simon means? Do you know what Simon means? Simon means a listener. That is, someone who doesn't speak very much, but who listens. Uh, and we know, I'm sure, people like that. They don't say very much, but we like to hear what they do say when they say it, because they've been thinking as they've been quietly sitting there and not saying a word. But Peter, as he became known, was called Simon by his parents. Now, the name says he was a listener, but that is not what Peter was, because every time we read in the Gospels about Peter, he is speaking. Uh, and that's a, an, another interesting concept. And, you know, there comes a time when even the good listeners will become good speakers because they realize that they have something that's important enough for others to hear. And that's what happens when we give our heart and life to Jesus. We very soon learn that what Jesus means to us is so important that others need to hear about it too. And so we want to share the good news with those that uh, we know. But Simon did not have any knowledge of Jesus as he was growing up. He went to school, but he wasn't the um, university type. He uh, had his eye on the family trade of fishing. And so it was rather unexpected that Jesus would call Simon to be his disciple, his uh, follower. But you know, there were two things that were said in the Bible about Simon Peter uh, and the other disciples. And one was that they were unlearned and ignorant men. That meant they didn't have college degrees. They were uneducated. They worked with their hands. They weren't academic and so on. But Jesus t tells us in the Bible that he takes the weak things of the world and confounds the mighty. So the important thing is relative to our knowledge of Jesus. That is the most important thing in the world. Not what we learn, not what we become but what we know about Jesus. So whatever else we might discover in life, this is the one thing that's of real importance. Who is Jesus? Why did Jesus come to earth? Why did he need to die upon the cross? And can I know him as my Savior 
and my friend? These are the important questions. And the other thing, the second thing about Peter is, not only did they say that he and the others were unlearned and ignorant men, but they said, these are the men who have turned the whole world upside down. Down. You know what that really means? They didn't turn the world upside down. They simply turned the world right side up. And whatever we are told, whatever others might say against the Lord Jesus, no matter how they might mock those who put their trust in Jesus, we know that we have the truth. We have the answers to life. And Jesus is the only answer to the problem of sin. Now, how did Simon become Peter? And how did Simon come to know the Lord Jesus? Well, next Sunday night, we're going to learn a little bit more about it. Now, we've already noted uh, in our previous studies that this chapter brings us the contrast between uh, the Old Testament covenant system and that of the New. And we have learned that the focus of the opening verses of the chapter center around that unique and special day of atonement held once a year in the calendar of the nation of Israel, and you will find that outlined in detail in Leviticus chapter 16. Now, that is uh, predominantly uh, set out for us in uh, that opening section from verse 1, and the contrast with the new covenant is then um, developed uh, through to uh, into verse 8, and uh, nine, 9 sets it out more specifically and exclusively, the Holy Spirit indicating this. So that becomes, as it were, the transitional verse. That's the turnover point. That's where the focus now will take us into the New Testament or into the New Covenant. So having uh, identified the significance, the importance, uh, the relevance of the Old Covenant under the law of the Old Testament. In verse 10, we are told uh, the, the main concept and also the main reason for that uh, Old Testament system. Verse 10, concerned only with foods and drinks, various washings, that is, ceremonial washings, and fleshly ordinances, that is, all of the ceremonies and the rituals and the symbolism and, and uh, all of those things identifying the uh, covenant of the Old Testament. And we read that this was imposed until the time of the Reformation. Now, that is not the Reformation that we refer to in church history. Um, you're probably aware that next uh, Sunday is uh, Reformation Sunday. And we remember the Reformers who give their lives and shed their blood in order to maintain a freedom of worship that we enjoy right to this day. But that's not the Reformation that is referred to here. It is, in fact, the, the, the new covenant that is outlined in the coming of uh, the Lord Jesus. And more will be brought out by the writer, uh, not only in chapter 9, but through into chapter 10. Look at verse 1 of chapter 10. For the law, that is the old covenant, having a shadow of the good things to come, and not the very image of the things, can never with these same sacrifices which they offer continually year by year 
make those who approach perfect. So we're going to hear more about this reformation uh, that uh, has been suggested and mentioned here in uh, this verse 10 of chapter 9. But coming back into verse 11, we have this uh, introduction now to what becomes the new covenant. But Christ came as high priest of the good things to come. And there are two thoughts that are suggested here that we, we do well to just take note of. And the first is, of course, the good things. And the second is to come. So here we are given, as it were, the broad reach of um, the coming of Jesus as the Messiah, his life, his ministry, and then eventually his death and resurrection, his uh, return to the Father, his intercession for his people, and then ultimately his return. All of these are suggested in the wording of the new covenant. And we will note as we go through how the writer develops that theme in this passage. But uh, you will note that there are, in fact, two words that um, are brought to our attention, particularly in verse 11. And one becomes the superlative of the other. It's a little bit like the good, better, best. You know, the building up of the superlatives that enhance the word and uh, draw it into a deeper uh, context. And you'll see that happens in verse 11. But Christ came as high priest of the good things to come. So here we have the good. And then we read, with the greater. So now we're moving from the good to the greater. So there is a developing theme here that's widening out, broadening out to give us a clearer picture of uh, how this is represented. Now there are several great things or good things that are mentioned in this epistle. So we have the good, and we have the great, and we have the greater. Now, because I want to do a little exercise with you, we won't look up all of these references, but you might be interested to know, if you take your Bible and just quickly come through with me, first of all, into chapter 2 of uh, Hebrews, we're going to stay in the book of Hebrews. Look at verse 3. How shall we escape if we neglect so great a salvation? Come over into chapter 4 and look at verse 14. And here we have a great high priest. In chapter 10, over into chapter 10, and uh, in verse 32, we have a great struggle with uh, sufferings. Down into verse 35, we have great reward. Over into chapter 12 and verse 1, we have a great crowd of witnesses. Chapter 13 and verse 20, we have a great shepherd of the sheep. So, all the way through the book of Hebrews, we're drawn into this sense of 
greatness. And so as we are now uh, developing this theme in chapter 9 <clears throat> of the contrast between the Day of Atonement and the Day of Sacrifice when Jesus died upon the cross, we are brought through the good, the great, into the greater. Uh, and you'll see that, that this thought is uh, continued. Um, come into Hebrews 11 and look at verse 26. Uh, so just, just hold, that, uh, hold that text for a, a moment. And uh, let's remind ourselves of verse 11 of chapter 9. Christ came as the high priest of the good things to come with the greater and more perfect tabernacle. Now remember, the tabernacle was the means of them recognizing the presence of God among them. Even though there were restrictions placed upon them in the fact that the veils of the tabernacle were meant to do two things. One, the veil, the final veil that protected the holiest of all was there to keep the glory of God in. The veil that kept the glory of God in was there to keep the people out. And that was the distinctive message of the tabernacle. Sinful man could not engage, no matter how much they desired it to be so, could not freely enter into and engage the presence of God. But now we come into the new covenant and to the sacrifice of Jesus, and we discover that the veil of the temple representing the veil of the tabernacle was rent in twain, torn in two, from the top to the bottom, representing the fact that this was not the work of man. This was the work of God. God reached out and he tore the veil. So the veil that separated the glory of God from sinful man and kept sinful man from the presence of the glory of God has been removed in the death of Jesus, in the sacrifice of Jesus. So now with that in mind, we come to uh, Hebrews uh, chapter 11 and verse 26. And here is that word greater again. Esteemed, that is Moses, remember, and, and the verses leading up to this will tell us. Let's just read from verse 24. By faith Moses, when he became of age, refused to be called the son of Pharaoh's daughter, choosing rather to suffer affliction with the people of God than to enjoy the passing pleasures of sin. Now here is the, the, the thought. Esteeming the reproach of Christ, here's the word, greater riches than the treasures in Egypt, for he looked to the reward. Now note, it doesn't say he looked for the award, but he looked to the reward. There's another word that describes what is referred to here in reward, and it's the word inheritance. We know that we are saved. The inheritance is not the reward of our salvation. 
The inheritance is the gift of God's mercy, love, and grace. We do not look to the inheritance in order to produce in us salvation, nor do we see the inheritance as an incentive for our salvation. But the inheritance is a vital part of our salvation. And to be encouraged to know it, to prove it, and to enjoy it, what do we need to do first? Deny ourselves, take up our cross, and follow Christ. So Moses did not know what lay ahead, but he had realized, recognized, he had bowed to the potential of his faith, outlined in verse 24. By faith, Moses made this calculation with all the riches of Pharaoh's house, with the potential of leadership in the nation of Egypt. He deemed it the wisest thing to say farewell to the wealth, to the comfort, to the security, and to cast his lot with the people of God. What was the measure of his treasure? Look at verse 26. Esteeming the reproach of Christ greater riches than the treasures in Egypt. Now, that is the concept that has been drawn out for us here in chapter 9 and in verse 11. Christ came as high priest of the good things to come with the greater and more perfect tabernacle, not made with hands, that is, not of this creation. So, the great things that are laid up in store, our reward, our inheritance, have all been secured by a greater sacrifice. All the riches of heaven can not be seen to be sufficient to measure as equal to the sacrifice of Christ. Christ's death on the cross has opened up the storehouse of heaven for us. Now, having set the, uh, the focus in chapter 11, and I, I want to get this in before we conclude, uh, otherwise you'll be left a little bit up in the air, and I want to finish this off uh, if we can. We come into verse 12 now of chapter 9. And uh, let's take this thought a little bit further. Let's go into the riches of the new covenant, the inheritance of the saints in Christ. Let's just note the difference between the old sacrifices and the sacrifice of Jesus. But Christ, verse 11, came as high priest. Now, how did he come? Well, verse 12. Not with the blood of goats and calves. You see, that is how the high priest came under the old covenant. That's how the high priest entered into the tabernacle, parted the veil, and went into the holiest place of all. But that is not what Christ did. That is not how Christ entered. He did not come to continue the old covenant. He came to satisfy its demands. He came to fulfill its 
responsibilities. So he did not need, as the high priest needed, the blood of goats or calves to bring with him. The high priest needed these because he himself had to be redeemed by the blood of the sacrifice. For he was a sinner. He must come the prescribed way. But Christ came as high priest of the good things to come. How did he come? Not with the blood of goats and calves, but with his own blood. He entered the most holy place once for all, having obtained eternal redemption. Now, just note that. If we miss this point, then we miss it all. The high priest took the blood And with the blood, he entered into the holy place. It was not yet confirmed that the offering would be acceptable unto God. But notice how Jesus entered, verse 12. Having obtained eternal redemption. Before Christ entered, he already had obtained eternal redemption. Remember on the cross, Jesus cried out, it is finished. It was after his death upon the cross, he went to preach to those who were imprisoned at the time of Noah. The work was still in the process, but the work had already been accomplished. And many more uh, concepts of Scripture uh, confirm and take us through that process, and time doesn't permit us to do so tonight. But this becomes uh, the, uh, the main thrust or thought. Uh, and verse 12 becomes predominant in teaching us these uh, truths. I want you, just as we conclude, to note the subtle contrast. The priest um, entered with the blood of goats and calves. Now, in the original, and we need to we need to underscore this. The original where we read, not with the blood of goats and calves, but with his own blood, he entered the most holy place. That uh, word with, that is also used in reference to the high priest going into the tabernacle, is not the word that ought to be used at this point. The literal translation of the word is by, not with, but by. It is on the basis of, on the reality of, on the value of his own blood, he entered inside the veil. The high priest had to enter with the blood of the sacrifice. So Christ entered by his own blood. Christ appeared and opened, as it were, heaven for sinners through the shedding of his blood, his sacrifice upon the cross. Sin is removed and forgiven by the shedding of the precious blood of Jesus. Now we have gone through to the middle of chapter 9 of Hebrews. And this is the first mention made of the blood of Jesus. And that's interesting and to a degree compelling because the writer has been wanting to demonstrate to us that Christ is superior 
over all other earthly things, including that means of approaching uh, unto God. But he waits to the ninth chapter before introducing us to the blood. And the reason for that, of course, is that he wants to to nail, as it were, in our minds and in our hearts the fact that even without the cross, Christ is greater than all other earthly institutions or means of approach to God. However, without the shedding of blood, there is no remission of sins. And now the writer wants to focus upon this reality, that it is the shedding of the blood of Jesus that elevates him to that position. It is as the mediator between God and man, by virtue of the blood that he shed, that he is greater than anything that has been produced under the old covenant. Now, nowhere in Scripture will you simply read of the blood without some qualification or some description or some clause that uh, explains the relevance of this term. You will never read of the blood without it being linked in some way to being the blood of Jesus. Uh, For example, in 1 John chapter 1 and verse 7, we read, If we walk in the light as he is in the light, we have fellowship one with another, and the blood of Jesus Christ, God's Son, cleanses from all sin. Now, when we look through the book of uh, Hebrews, and we we might do that very quickly as we uh, bring this time to an end. Or if you would rather not look them up, I'll simply make reference to them. And I want you to do a little exercise. I want you to count the number of times we read from this beginning in chapter 9 through to the end of Hebrews. I want you to count the number of times that we read about the blood of Jesus. Chapter 9, verse 12, we've already noted this. His own blood. Chapter 9, verse 14, the blood of Christ. Chapter 10, Verse 19, the blood of Jesus. Chapter 10, verse 29, the blood of the covenant. Chapter 12, verse 24, the blood of sprinkling. Chapter 13, verse 12, his own blood. Chapter 13, verse 20, the blood of the everlasting covenant. Now, were you able to count the number of times that the blood of Jesus is mentioned in this epistle? If not, then simply come with me to Leviticus chapter 16. Leviticus chapter 16. Let's go to verse 18 and 19. And he that is the high priest shall go out to the altar that is before the Lord and make atonement for it and shall take some of the blood of the bull and some of the blood of the goat and put it on the horns of the altar all around. Then 
He shall sprinkle some of the blood on it with his finger seven times. Cleanse it, consecrate it from the uncleanness of the children of Israel. Before the blood was sprinkled on the altar, it was sprinkled seven times as the high priest moved from the outer altar toward the holiest place of all. How many times is the blood of Jesus mentioned in Hebrews? Seven times. So here the writer is again confirming that Scripture bears its truth. And when we read of the work of Christ's sacrifice has been a greater work. We learn the extent of that, the full value of that, the full meaning of that. And we recognize that neither is there salvation in any other. There is no other name under heaven given amongst men whereby we must be saved. For there is only one mediator between God and man. And here he is, our great high priest and king, the one who shed his blood in order that we may be presentable to a holy God. We are accepted in the beloved. Let's pray. Loving Father, we thank you again for your word tonight and pray that it will encourage our hearts and help us in our understanding so that we will value and treasure this relationship that you have established with us as you have placed us into the very family of God. We pray in our Savior's name. Amen.